Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, it's a pleasure to have Shreesha Danaretti back to do another talk for us. I think most of you know Shreesha, part of our expert panel here, and assistant director for Madison Clinic, and I'll turn it over to Shreesha to talk about vaccines. Great. Thanks for inviting me to do this talk again. I think it's always uh, fun to refresh our memories about what we should be doing in the areas of controversy. Um, I'm going to go through these vaccines, but then I think afterwards I'd like to have a period of discussion and also to hear what folks are doing at the different clinics, uh, particularly when there are areas of controversy um, regarding vaccination. So, overview, just reviewing general principles, what's recommended in HIV-infected adults, how do we use live vaccines in this population, and then some special considerations about non-response and uh, revaccination. Obviously, the goal of vaccination is prevention. We want to prevent disease in our patients. Uh, things to think about are timing. We never know what the optimal timing is. Should we do uh, um, a lot of these vaccinations upon entry into care? Should we wait and that, uh, until they're on antiretroviral therapy, if they're going on antiretroviral therapy? We know that patients who have low CD4 counts tend to have poor response to a number of vaccines, um, and also lack of virologic suppression is associated with poor response with certain vaccines as well. The pros for vaccinating early, obviously, are to prevent infection uh, when they enter into care. So a lot of vaccines that people end up doing right upon entry into care is, such as influenza, uh, for instance, because we vaccinate everyone for influenza seasonally, uh, and if someone's coming in during flu season, we're not necessarily going to wait a few months until they're virologically suppressed or their CD4 counts go up to immunize them. But there may be some other vaccines that they get once in their life or once every five years that we'd want to wait until they have some um, better immune response potentially. And then uh, some general principles about live vaccines and low CD4 counts that we'll talk about. Hepatitis A. Uh, vaccine. It's now a universal vaccine at age one year. So many of our younger patients uh, that we see in clinic are have been vaccinated at birth. And we should find out if that's happened, if they were born here and if that was done at birth. We know that amongst HIV positive children who were a study that 100% of them with CD4 counts over 20% actually zero converted. So with patients who have high CD4 counts, it seems to be a pretty effective vaccine when we look at um, the, immuno the, uh, immune, uh, the immunologic response. It's currently recommended uh, amongst HIV infected adults who are MSM, IDU, have chronic liver disease, or travel to endemic countries. That being said, I think most of us immunized individuals who are, don't as display evidence of uh, immunity, regardless of whether they have these risk factors, but I will also say that most everybody in our clinic has one of these risk factors as a risk factor for HIV. The OI guidelines, it's interesting, recommend checking antibody one month after the series. Although there's really no correlate of immunity that's been demonstrated saying that this antibody level is associated with this level of protection. And we know that there is a lot of seroreversion with hepatitis A. And that doesn't mean that people are not protected. There's likely an anamnestic response. Therefore, the ACIP guidelines actually don't recommend serologic testing after the Hep A series. So that's one area of controversy. And after this discussion, I'd like to hear what people are doing with regards to Hep A vaccination and checking antibody responses uh, afterwards. Hepatitis B, another area of controversy. We know that now it's again another universal vaccination at birth. Kids are getting tons of vaccines. We know that. It's unlike hepatitis A, where they clearly delineate certain key groups that are, are, are at risk, uh, hepatitis B vaccination is recommended for not all HIV-infected adults who are not immunized, don't have some evidence of immunity. The efficacy greatly varies. Number of studies have shown low efficacy, 18%, up to 72%, and these varied throughout the, the era of uh, antiretroviral therapy and with regards to CD4 count. Um, there's also been, uh, th there have been studies that show that once someone is virologically suppressed, they have a higher likelihood of 
um, uh, zero uh, conversion or immunologic response to this vaccine. There was actually a study done here um, by Dr. Harrington and, and uh, Nina Kim that showed that it was more the CD4 count nadir that was associated with immunologic response to vaccines. So if you have someone who's low, they may just never respond to the vaccine, even if you do get their CD4 counts up with um, therapy. ASIP actually recommends 40 microgram dosing, which is the double dose uh, times three or four doses of the Energix, depending, this, there's two different brands of vaccine that are recommended or that could be used. This is analogous to what is done in hemodialysis patients. That's the ASIP recommendation. The OI prevention guidelines recommendation is different. It's for 20 microgram dosing, so the single strength dosing times three, which is what's done in the general population. There are some comments as to what you can do if there's lack of response or that you can consider starting with a double dose, but they don't come out right and say, do the double dose out front. So that, that's an area of controversy. The other issue that's been an area of controversy is the isolated core antibody positivity. And that in, in a lot of settings is up to 10% of patients who are HIV positive have an isolated core antibody positive. We actually looked at that at the Madison Clinic and we found that to be true that 10% of our patients were isolated core positive. So what do you do in that situation? It could indicate that it's a past infection with a waning surface antibody. So they've been exposed in the past and they've just over time have a waning antibody response. But that doesn't mean that if they were exposed to hepatitis B, they wouldn't have a memory response to that infection and actually truly be protected, which is called an anamnestic response. It could be a false positive or it could be indicative of a cult active hep B infection, so where they do have hep B DNA in their blood. It's unclear what to do with regards to vaccination, and I mentioned the ACIP guidelines and the OI prevention guidelines. There's a new body, that, uh, there's another a document that was just updated from the 2009 document, the primary care HIV guidelines, which were just published in CID late last year that have something else to say now. So uh, we have uh, one group of that says, maybe if you have unexplained persistently abnormal transaminases, you could consider checking in hep B DNA. Most I think would give a booster vaccine and look for anamnestic response, that memory response, or give a complete series. Last year, the OI guidelines update actually recommended doing a complete series for patients who have an isolated core with a surface antibody checked one month after completion of the vaccine to demonstrate that they actually have uh, protective antibody that develops after the vaccination series. The problem with doing it later is that they could have zero reversion again if you check it a year later and then you actually don't know, did they get an appropriate antibody response? The HIV primary care guidelines actually come out and recommend checking a hep B DNA and vaccinating if negative. So a number of studies have looked at what happens if you have an isolated core and if you check hep B DNA on those. There's been at least two studies that I know of that show in some populations it's as low as 2% actually have hep B DNA positivity. And there was one study that showed potentially up to 15 to 20%. That one was an older study. The newer one showed about 2%. And in some of those patients, they didn't know if it was true viremia or not. They tended to have low hep B DNA levels, and it was in primary Asian population, so where they have a lot higher endemicity for this infection than we do here in the US. So it's unclear what, what and I would like to hear your thoughts after this discussion, what people are doing for their 10% of patients who have isolated core positivity. I will tell you at the Madison Clinic, we before these various guidelines came out and it was sort of murky waters what to do, we, uh, uh, we actually instituted a protocol to give one vaccine dose and then recheck their antibody level two to four weeks afterwards to see if that one extra dose made a difference. There, uh, the study that I worked on with Jared Baton in Africa looking at HIV positive individuals who didn't, res to, uh, in their response to hep B vaccination, there was about a 70% response rate with three doses. But by just giving one extra dose, that was greater than 95% response. So we may not have to do the complete series, which is what's recommended. Um, but again, there are these various guidelines for isolated core. 
pneumococcal vaccine used to be pretty straightforward, now is a little bit more confusing, and I went through this before. Uh, we used to just do the polysaccharide vaccine, which made things very convenient. You just give it once and then give it again in five years, and then when they're older than 65, you give it again. Um, the recommendations are really no different uh, with regards to um, this vaccine as they are to other adults with other immunocompromising conditions or chronic lung disease, smokers, alcoholics. We all we do the the two dose. We do at least one dose, and but in HIV individuals, we repeat it at five years. The difference came uh, in 2012 when uh, the ACIP came out with formal recommendations to actually start using the conjugate vaccine, which we know in our, with pediatric experience, conjugate vaccines are actually better at producing an immunologic response. We just don't have a lot of data in adults to use it more widespread compared to the polysaccharide vaccine. But we do have some data, although limited, in HIV infected individuals that suggest that it's an effective vaccine. Um, and in this study from Malawi, Prevnar 7, which was what was available at the time, prevented recurrent pneumococcal, invasive pneumococcal disease um, in 74% 74, 74 of recurrent invasive pneumococcal disease in an HIV infected population of adults. So um, the, this is actually from David, this, uh, trying to make it more simple, but still hard to remember. Uh, for All you need to remember is that all adults get three of these, va three vaccines, and then again, we reevaluate them at age 65 to get another Pneumovax. But everybody should get two Prevnars, two, one Prevnar and two polysaccharide vaccines. The timing is where it gets confusing. If someone hasn't been vaccinated, I just generally give the, the Prevnar first, the conjugate vaccine first, you wait eight weeks, and then you can give the polysaccharide, and again, five years later. If they've already had a polysaccharide, then you have to wait a year, and that has to do with potentially conflicting immunologic responses. And so you wanna wait a year, and then give the Prevnar, and then you can wait you know, the, between five years between the first and second um, polysaccharide vaccine. So that's kind of the key to remember, uh, and this is a great way that David has put this together. We have a tree and an algorithm in our clinic that everybody refers to to uh, kind of remember all the timelines of how to do this. Influenza, we're actually starting to see more influenza in our community, and it's important to remember to vaccinate people with HIV. It's no different. The vaccine recommendations. Now it's recommended for all adults, all children, eight or grade, age greater than six months. So pretty much everybody should be vaccinated for influenza. The efficacy is sort of unknown, but that's kind of the case for all comers because we just don't know how good of an antigenic match it is from year to year. And we've had four of our own residents develop influenza, documented influenza at Harborview who actually were vaccinated. So. Um, so it, it, the efficacy ranges all over the place, uh, regardless of whether you're immunocompromised or not. An important thing to remember is that household members can get the live vaccine. There's not been any documented uh, vaccine strain uh, transmission. Uh, even though the live vaccine is not recommended currently uh, for people with HIV, it's probably safe in people that are, are uh, relatively immunocompetent with HIV. There's just not really any data and there's not gonna be recommendations given that we have an inactivated vaccine. Tdap, again, no specific recommendations for people with HIV. And remember that it replaces a, a TD dose and regardless of when they've had their tetanus booster in the past, they should get Tdap for pertussis protection. HPV, so there, there was actually a question from Dave Hatchie about this HPV vaccine, and uh, we can talk about that. There's, the guidelines say that, I mean, it's a safe vaccine, it's not a live vaccine. Uh, you can give it an HIV and other immunocompromising conditions. There's a bivalent and quadrivalent. In general, we use the quadrivalent vaccine. In females, either is recommended up to age 26, optimal age around 11. Um, the quadrivalent vaccine is what's recommended in men, age 11 to 26. There are no recommendations for HIV positive individuals age greater than six. That being said, there, has been, there have been some studies looking at uh, older populations of MSM uh, with HIV who get the vaccine. There was an uh, AIDS malignancy consortium study that was done. One of the sites was here in Seattle. 
the mean age was 44 in those individuals, and there was thought to be some benefit from vaccinating individuals even age greater than 26. Although, again, the criticism of that study is that we don't really know a good correlate of immunity. Do antibodies stay in the blood for a long time? We don't know. So just because there are antibodies to these oncogenic HPV strains aren't there, we don't actually know if they've been exposed or not. And most individuals have been exposed to some of these forms of HPV. So we just don't know how much bang we're getting for our buck. And the limitation has really been the cost of what, cost effectiveness. When they've done cost effectiveness analyses in the general population, it was felt that 26 was really the limit because uh, you didn't really get a whole lot of benefit after that. That being said, there are some providers who are giving HPV vaccine to MSM age greater than 26 who have no documented history of anal cancer or anal dysplasia to protect them from getting dysplasia. That again is an off-label use. It's not gonna be covered by insurance and this vaccine is about $360 for um, the course. So not a lot of our patients can get it. So the issue with live vaccines, um, less controversy about varicella. So all adults without evidence of immunity whose CD4 counts greater than 200 should get varicella vaccine. This is basically extrapolated from pediatric data. We don't have any uh, data specifically in adults for varicella vaccine, um, but it was safe and immunogenic in uh, children up to the age of eight that were studied. And so that's what's been used for adults. Uh, I'd be curious to know how many of you are asking about chickenpox history when you do an intake or doing a varicella titer and then immunizing. The primary care guidelines actually recommend doing that, but I will say that that's not routinely done. We don't, as adult providers, at least, I know a lot of you are family practice and think more broadly than we do as internists um, and probably ask these questions, but that's not always on our radar as, it, as adult providers. The Zoster vaccine, I think, is was we're hoping to have some more clarity. In fact, there's less clarity on what to do. Um, we know that their area of, uh, that there's no controversy is that it's contraindicated for patients with CD4 counts less than 200. There has been one abstract presented at Croy in 2012, which has yet to be published, that showed that it was safe and immunogenic in patients with CD4 counts greater than 200 and viral loads that were suppressed. We haven't seen that paper published yet, and I'm not quite sure why that is, and therefore it hasn't been adopted into the guidelines of what to do in our patients. Um, the OI guidelines actually are in line with the ACIP guidelines that say basically we don't know what to do for great patients greater than 200. The vaccine guidelines for immunocompromised hosts, um, actually in the text we put that it was uh, there are no recommendations because of the lack of data uh, so far. But on the table, as David pointed out, there's an X, and that's because uh, it's just currently not recommended or lack of recommendation. Interestingly, the primary care guidelines that just came out have a totally different suggestion, which is recommend considering for age greater than 60 with CD4 count less than, uh, greater than 200. And as you all probably know, in our patient population, we see a lot of VZV reactivation, and it doesn't have to do with age. So that initial data for immunocompetent hosts was based on the fact that there is a tenfold higher or even higher fold risk in patients age greater than 50 and definitely greater than 60 um, for zoster reactivation. In our HIV positive individuals, we know that just having HIV puts them at higher risk for VZV reactivation. So unclear where the recommendation for greater than 60 is, except that the vaccine is FDA approved for greater than 50 and ACIP greater than, uh, or recommended for greater than 60. So it's kind of melding some of those guidelines and recommendations. So again, unclear, and I'd be curious to hear what people are doing if you are using Zoster vaccine in your clinic or not. One issue might be uh, insurance issues that come up given that it doesn't have an FDA approval for patients who are immunocompromised. And MMR, again, similar to other live vaccines, not less than uh, 200. MMRV, we don't carry that vaccine in our clinic, but contraindicated in individuals with HIV. 
I mentioned, alluded to this before, what is, what is a response and is there a correlative immunity? We don't have a correlative immunity with many vaccines. I think the clearest the case is for hepatitis B, where we know that a protective titer is greater than 10. And we know that the optimal timing is usually soon after the vaccine, one to two months after completion of the dose. The primary care guidelines actually recommend checking the titer one to two months after the completion of the dose or at the next visit, which could be in many cases six months later. So un unclear uh, whether it, some patients would have seroreversion at that time. And I know that's what a lot of providers do in the clinic because it's not convenient for patients to come back for a blood draw one month after, especially if they're not getting their CD4 counts and viral loads checked except every six months to every year. And then the other consideration is repeating vaccine series. And this really comes up for hepatitis B more than any other vaccine, um, repeating the series potentially to optimize uh, response if there you have an initial non-responder. So consider when viral load suppressed, CD4 count increase, and consider doubling the dose. And in this JAMA article that came out in 2011 where the HIV-infected individuals were given double dose times four versus standard dosing, 82% response rate versus 65 response rate. So consider doing that for your patients if, if you have a non-responder. And this is the newest version from 2014, obviously hasn't been updated yet since we're early into the year, but this is what the ACIP guidelines recommend, which is mostly in line with these other bodies except for the areas that I've highlighted. And I'd be curious what people think at that point about these controversies.